Close your eyes and picture a city. What do you see? Cars and busy streets? Buildings? Subways? Doors closing. When Luis Betancourt pictures a city, he sees math. You can imagine that it's sort of a big matrix of interaction, right? Mathematicians call that a graph. Numbers. So when you think about any kind of mathematical modeling, particularly when you carry it over to cities, it's about the most basic stuff. Equations. But the fact is, all this sort of more mathematical understanding of how cities actually work allows you to do that planning and understand that as the city, for example, grows, it doesn't mean that you just proportionally add streets and buildings. Actually, there's a qualitative transformation. Luis Betancourt is a professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago and the director of the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation. So the idea is really to think about cities in a way that allows us to think about the great problems and solutions that are necessary going going forward for an urban planet. When Betancourt says urban planet, he isn't kidding. In the last decade, there's been a mass migration of people to urban areas across the globe. This urbanization has been dangerously unsustainable for our cities, and it's projected to get worse in the next decade. Betancourt's research, explaining the math behind how our cities function, couldn't come at a more crucial time. Because if you can understand the numbers, you can create models for more sustainable cities. We still have lots of problems about conflict, you know, exploitation and market failures about how cities work. We have, of course, the problem of sustainability and health, the fact that a lot of how we run our energy and resource systems is unsustainable. And so we need to change those mm. while preserving what is good about cities. From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, Luis Betancourt and the future of cities. I'm your host, Paul Rand. Betancourt is working with a team of researchers, technicians, urban planners, and even the United Nations to form a global urban sustainability project, one that he hopes will reshape the future of our cities for the better. But before he was one of the world's leading experts on urban development, he was actually a physicist. On the one hand, I think growing up, sort of being a curious kid in school, I got interested in science, and physics was really sort of the ultimate science. It is a culture of thinking about the world more than it is a subject matter. It's sort of a way of thinking about processes in the world, how things work. Right. And then from that perspective, kind of pushing on them a little bit to see where they lead. So you can see, for example, how certain forces may create a crystal, or how gravity may create a star, or the Earth, or, or a galaxy. Right. So from the point of view of processes, the dynamics, you can end up with very different end states, different things that are created and that work in different ways. Okay. And so that's a very powerful and generative window into the world. Betancourt began to see that in the same way there are processes that dictate the laws of physics, there are also processes that underlie the way people interact and organize themselves. And when he was just a fledgling scientist, a health crisis from across the world gave him an opportunity to put his ideas to the test. There was an epidemic outbreak of a terrible disease called a Marburg virus in okay. Angola. There were these reports uh, in major publications, New York Times and others, about this crazy disease. It's a bit like Ebola. It's, it's a bad way to go. What happens with this kind of diseases is that people sometimes first underreport because they don't know it exists, so they attribute what's going on to other diseases, and then overreport when there's a bit of panic. Got it. And you know, the numbers had a certain logic. So, you know, I just started playing with the numbers and I made a model and I could make a prediction. And at some point I was following it, a bit like weather prediction. And then I got in touch with people at the World Health Organization saying, this, this thing you just reported has to be wrong, <laughs> such as the hubris of youth. Eventually, did they respond back and think that it was really <laughs> beneficial what you were helping them understand? Uh, I didn't get a lot of constructive criticism, <laughs> okay. but I, I did, they did review the numbers. Okay. Uh, and, and it was wrong eventually, but it took a long <laughs> time to figure out. But that was the beginning of a model of networks and how people transmit diseases and how this is mediated through a society. And it was a way to take a few numbers that were just in the media and being able to say something interesting and maybe important practically. As Betancourt became obsessed with understanding the math behind the networks that shape human societies, it was inevitable that his research would begin to focus on the places with more human interactions than anywhere else. Cities. So when you think about a city, it's frankly about how people exist in space and time, right? So this is kind of interesting as a way of thinking. It's a distinction between the thing you see 
you know, the buildings, the roads, the trains, the cars, and the things that are going on, the processes, right? And from that perspective, then you say, okay, so what are those processes? They're essentially people living in place, but then interacting with each other. And it, it's those interactions that make the city. So all this we've been discussing, you can put in math, right? right? So the city is really, when you do the math of it, it's how you put these two networks together, the network of interactions between people and the network of things. Now, so, the magic is that you can turn that into a mathematical set of equations that predicts numbers. What do you so mean? So you can take, well, you can tell, for example, how much more street you need as you uh, double the size of the city. Okay. Or you can say how much the GDP is going to grow. And understand that as the city, for example, grows, it doesn't mean that you just proportionally add streets and buildings. Actually, that's a qualitative transformation. Once Betancourt understood the mathematics, he could explain the dynamics of how cities function and answer some important questions. Like, why is it that high concentrations of people create benefits for the entire group? Betancourt found an answer in something he calls the multiplicity effect. I think everyone has an intuition for this, right? Okay. You visit sort of a large city and you tend to see new things. You tend to see that people tend to make more money, but also spend more money. So things are kind of amped up, mm. right? There are more things per unit space, there's higher density. These are all sort of multiplications as a percentage intensity that kind of grow with the size of the city disproportionately. So not proportionally, but mm. actually disproportionately to the number of people and the size of the space of the city. That intensification comes across sort of as a feeling in terms of speed and density. So space is compressed and time is accelerated. Okay. Right? So that's why we all feel stressed in larger cities. Right. But it's also exciting at the same time. So that effect, you can do the math again, this is the magic of it, and get numbers out for how much things increase. But the idea, I think, became most clear in technology with the internet, which is that the value that come out of a network, so a system of interaction or interacting with other people, is often not to do with the number of participants, the number of people, but the number of links. And those essentially grow like, if you didn't have space and constraints, would grow like the square, the number of people times the number of people again. So that's what gives you this amplification. Mm. You, by intensifying and multiplying interactions, you can multiply the things being exchanged and potentially the benefits, sometimes the costs, of what is going on in these networks. If this is not done well, right? What what, what do you see when this isn't working in a, in a in a planned, purposeful way? Right. So more interactions can mediate more violence, right? Okay, exactly. Uh, so that's clear crime, violence, etc. But that tends to make the system disintegrate right. at some points. So, or uh, so. It's a little bit self-regulated, but of course you'd like to avoid it in the first place. And if you understood the logic of cities as we've been talking about, you would have somehow. If you start constructing for it, you realize what the implications are for not building these safeguards in. And That's right. deciding what you're going to be prescriptive on and where you're going to lease That's freedom right. to. Uh, we often approach cities, at least in our daily lives, in our policy through our frustrations, mm -hmm. through you know the things that don't work or the pollution or the congestion or the costs. Right. But I always play this game of asking people, so do you live in Chicago or the city you live in because of its costs, because of its crime rate, because of this or that? And they say, no. So why do you live in Chicago? And obviously the answer is because I have opportunities. I like my job or I like my friends or, you know, it's because of how you embed it in terms of what you do and the people you know. And so this is true everywhere. And that's the mechanism by which people open horizons for what they are and what they could be. In the United States, there's a general trend of people leaving major cities, but the rest of the planet is urbanizing. The number of people projected to move to major cities over the next decade is staggering. Betancourt says this could be a massive opportunity or a disaster. Will we develop ways to create sustainable cities or degrade our cities into anarchy? Betancourt is working on a globe-spanning project that he hopes will lead our cities into the future. That's after the break. Capitalism is the engine of prosperity. Actually, it sows the seeds of its own demise. Could both be right? I'm Kate Waldock from Georgetown University. And I'm Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago. We're the hosts of Capitalism, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. We're going to share the sort of irreverent banter you'd hear between economists at a bar. That is, if economists were to go to a bar. Subscribe to Capitalism. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts.
So the concept of cities right now, my understanding is that the number of people that will be moving into urban areas, whether it's just natural moves or because of everything ranged from climate change or other weather conditions, is really pretty meaningfully increasing. Is that right? That's right. It's very different in different parts of the world, has to be said. But this is a moment where most people in Asia and Africa, so the two continents that have uh, the largest amount of populations and still the fastest population growth, are urbanizing. What kind of numbers are you looking at increasing-wise? So the estimates vary a little bit, but we're looking at uh, several billion people, maybe a couple billion people, moving to cities or living in cities through natural births in the next uh, few decades. And this migration presents some massive challenges. Many of the cities are already dangerously full, so people end up creating new neighborhoods on the outskirts. But these places are often devoid of resources and infrastructure. They're part of the city and yet separate. These areas are among Betancourt's biggest concerns. It's estimated that maybe almost a billion people around the world live in slums today and is, is a, uh, a neighborhood in a city. It could be outside a city, but typically in a city, where people occupy land, but they don't have a legal status, and they don't have services, they don't have addresses, okay. they don't have street networks. It was on a research expedition to one of these neighborhoods that Betancourt got the idea for his new project. This is in Accra, in Ghana. And there's this very special neighborhood. It's called Old Fadama. But it's also known as Sodom and Gomorrah, I think, by others. It's a neighborhood of people who work, porters and workers in the market, in the main street market of the city. So this is the market where all the food and all the goods come into the city and then get redistributed. They're sort of on a lagoon, so part of the neighborhood was exposed to a sea rise, and so they had to move some of the structures. And so they managed to be in contact with the city to to relocate and then rebuild some of that part of the neighborhood. But as part of that, what they had done was to create a street network. They themselves, like the residents, right? And you say, why are you using space where, you know, you obviously have lack of space? And they said, no, look, this way we can carry stuff through, the fire engine can come, the ambulance can come. And, you know, people like the shops along the streets. And so for me, this is very interesting because of course I had read tons of urbanism and history of cities. And that's the same process that anyone will describe cities evolved by, you know, historically, right. not as plans uh, in the 20th century, but sort of as the gradual evolution of neighborhoods that makes them interesting. So I started thinking about that. And I thought, well, you know, it's the same thing we talk about at the networks, right? So what you have here is sort of a network of people and places like the places where you live and work, the buildings that need to be interconnected by a common space in which you can circulate and deliver functions. And I said, but that's a math problem, mm. right? And so we thought, if it's a math problem, we could do it everywhere. So we started working on this, and you know, a few years later, we came up with some practical ways to look at any neighborhood, uh. look at what streets exist and what places exist, find if they're connected or not, and if they're not connected, what little bits of connection could they use such that that evolution of the neighborhood is gradual. And so this is something people call reblocking, but that, you know, you can have an algorithm suggest something because it's math, but then we put these solutions in the hands of people such that they tell us it's dumb or they want to do something else and they'll tell them but you'll have to build more. But and that data. becomes an interactive process based on data and yep. based on maps that solves sort of a complicated development problem. If data from one neighborhood could give you solutions to problems of urban development more broadly... Imagine what you could learn from compiling the data from a hundred neighborhoods or a thousand. Betancourt went even further by developing the Million Neighborhoods Project. It's both a network of people okay. that have agency in the space and then a supportive technology that allows us to be talking about my neighborhood, your neighborhood, neighborhoods all over the world, so a million neighborhoods. The more data, the more math. The more math, the better we can understand the processes of sustainable development. And the more processes we can understand, the more we can share them with developing cities across the world. The idea is that if you want to address issues of equity and inequality, this has a very strong place-based, so neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood expression in any city. And a neighborhood lenses allows you to see these inequalities and also creates accountability in a way that essentially is collaborative so that we are trying to address similar problems, learning from each other, mm. but also creating the scale, not working just parochially one neighborhood at a time, creating the scale in which some of these problems emerge as common across many places and then justify 
and encourage the participation of people like us who are researchers who want to work on general problems to some extent at least or people in technology or business that also want scale in order to create solutions. Okay, so now you ha you're gathering a lot of data. That's right. What do you do with it? So what's special is that you can do this. So there's just this moment of opening up vision where you can look throughout the world and see every neighborhood, everything about the built environment, certainly. Is this As, like Google Maps or something different? It's a bunch of things that feel like Google Maps, but Google Maps belongs to Google, and so it's largely proprietary. But most of this data is coming from remote sensing, so people with satellites that are ever more precise. Okay. So you can now have basically see everything in a, in a photo from a satellite that's in about so the size of your hand. Okay. So that means that f just in the last few years, you can see objects instead of just a blur of a city. Mm. So I call that that we reach the urban scale. Got it. So this is very special. We've seen cities we've never seen before, building by building, street by street. So there's mapping that's just happening and coming through all these different avenues. And then there's a lot of community organization also that using maps as sort of a, an instrument to express their own reality and communicate what they have and what they don't have. And so the map and sort of the urban plan become almost, uh, are becoming fluid. And mm -hmm. that's a very interesting situation where we, not only can we see things for the first time, we can also animate those things into future possibilities. So that's what we're doing, is basically have a map of the world, okay. neighborhood by neighborhood highlighting the places that are lacking infrastructure and street networks. That technological platform is a way to also hold these ideas of collaboration, put everyone, as I like to call it, on the same map. Got it. So putting people on the same map is also a bit of a political strategy so that they see at least some of the same reality and uh, work together towards some of the same solutions. So by gathering all this data, you're starting to see what on a broader scale at different stages of development. That's right. What's working at which stage and right. where can you be guiding people to help learn from others? So it's not That's right. And done. we have, in many places of the world, we have a network of people that work in each neighborhood. Understood. Like, you know, we okay. work a lot of people in West Africa, in India, of course, in Chicago. So they have specific problems. Sometimes they're common, sometimes they're quite different. But the idea is that there's a process of organizing communities and, and working between the city and the community in a way that creates a model of policy and urban planning is much more collaborative. But then that requires uh, to be fast and sustainable new elements that are not typical of what people can do locally. Got it. So that's very important then to bring in people who are researchers, who are at the forefront of technology and other capabilities that allows us to create fast, uh, sustainable development quickly such that you know a billion people are not in slums, but that development is also sustainable. The Million Neighborhoods Project holds a lot of promise for addressing some of urbanization's gravest challenges. In fact, it holds so much promise that even the United Nations has gotten involved. Exactly. So in the, in the context of the United Nations, since 2015, there have been a series of international agreements that set policy till 2030 and maybe a little bit beyond. It's called Agenda 2030. Hmm. And there are several things about that, including the Paris Climate Agreement and some other things. But the central connecting tissue for that is something called the Sustainable Development Goals, which has 17 goals with metrics they're supposed to apply everywhere. And when you look at them, they're really about solving all the great problems of humanity and our relationship with the environment in the next 10 years. So in October, we're convening a global symposium on sustainable cities and neighborhoods. Uh, if you go back a few decades, we're thinking about sustainability and development at the national level, at the global level, look at, at global problems of climate. But increasingly what's been happening is that cities and then neighborhoods are really becoming the focus of agency, where people feel they can do something about that transformation. Got it. Where there can be, you know, accountability because it's very close to people's experience and where there can be social capacity to also create change. But the challenge then is to create sort of a bit of a movement that's enabled by new knowledge and new technology, as well as local priorities that can create that network of development. So we're bringing people from all over the world to try to basically pose that challenge and try to articulate a vision going forward. So what we hope will come out of this event is really uh, obviously a set of collaborations, but also sort of a, a, a plan, a set of ideas that allows us to reframe the, pro the process of sustainable uh, human development in cities and neighborhoods with this local focus that at the same time cuts across scales that creates, you know, walkable, local and sustainable cities, but at the same time 
solves the kind of uh, issues of urban planning and development that we're facing in the next decades. Betancourt spends a lot of his time and energy addressing the pitfalls and challenges of urban planning, but he retains a powerful sense of positivity and optimism about the ability of cities to improve our world. That's coming up after the break. If you're listening to Big Brains, there's a good chance you consider yourself a lifelong learner. However, you may not know about the University of Chicago's Graham School and its focus on continuing liberal and professional studies. For more than a century, Graham has been a destination for lifelong learners. They offer courses online and in the classroom, bringing the transformative education U Chicago is known for to students of all ages. To learn more about the courses, certificates, and degrees, visit graham.uchicago.edu. Despite the concerns of urbanization, Betancourt still sees cities as beautiful, powerful things that can generate immense good in our world. You think about what cities do, how is it that they could do the same thing better and in a sustainable way? So some things are obvious. You have to imagine replacing existing infrastructure with infrastructure that doesn't use, for example, fossil fuels. Got it. Right? But all that, you know, you could end up almost with the same looking city, you know, electric car substitutes, diesel car, and it looks the same. But the real opportunity, the thing that gives you these multiplicative effects that allows cities to be agents of growth, is that they're not just about substitution of the material of the thing, but that they're creating new possibilities, have new information for new kinds of solutions for the way we use these things. Whether, you know, we use cars more like a hybrid between public transportation and private transportation, or that, you know, as we electrify a city, there'll be all these gains in efficiency because electrical things are much more efficient in terms of energy transmission than burning stuff. Or uh, things like health and noise. Cities will feel very different once you take away things that are all these engines and motors that run everything. So you need science to have this extrapolation of ideas from what is to new situations without breaking the good things about cities. Okay. So this network view, this dynamical network view of cities where it's mostly about information, interdependence, is just emerging as something that's not just a set of ideas that of course have been discussed for a long time, but something that you can also model, test, and then apply in context by, you know, doing policy and engineering. Uh, now, what needs to happen though is that some of the bad things are still with us. We still have lots of problems about conflict and, you know, exploitation and market failures about how cities work. We have, of course, the problem of sustainability and health, the fact that a lot of how we run our energy and resource systems is unsustainable. And so we need to change those while preserving what is good about cities. I think it's perfectly possible to imagine how that transformation will occur. And if you allow me to be to go big and be a little bit whimsical. It's something that even from the perspective of how we function as a species is profound. If we go indeed to a, a logic in which our energy doesn't come from burning stuff and plants ultimately in the sun, we'll be the first sort of natural species that gets its energy from the source, right. back from the sun and its consequences. And it's not therefore in competition, if we do it well, with life in order to create um, you know, a good human society. I think a lot of people like to see that happening. Yeah, exactly. But we have to learn how to do that, both operationally, which there's a lot going on, but we don't know if it's fast enough. But also then to turn what has been sort of a a relationship that's been negative, exploitative, into one that's positive. Because we'll be bringing energy and resources into nature in ways that didn't happen before and into human societies in ways that they can function better. Big Brains is a production of the U Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. Our show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap. Thanks for listening.